Easter morning after the storm, a story of Mary Magdalene. And this was shared to us by Dr. Ralph Wilson. It was like a violent storm had gone through, leaving destruction in its wake. But early this Sunday morning, all is quiet. The lull after the so storm, or so it seems, to Mary. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you the story. First, there is Jesus, the leader and prophet from Galilee. When his popularity was at its apex in Jerusalem, just the week before, many had considered him the Messiah. But on Friday, his enemies had succeeded and crucified him. There are soldiers guarding his tomb. Why? His enemies had heard a report that Jesus was supposed to rise again on the third day. Preposterous, his enemy said, but they could take no chances. If there was a guard, especially a Roman guard, his disciples wouldn't dare steal the body and claim he had been raised. Keep a lid on any story that might re-inflame the populist. That was the plan. In the moist, bone-chilling darkness, the soldiers huddled around a sputtering fire that flickers ghostly images amidst the shadow of the tombs. They're not afraid. Mind you, just ill at ease, anxious for the dawn that will soon brighten the horizon. Jesus, his disciples figure in the story too, but they're afraid, terrified that they too will be arrested because of the close association with Jesus. They are hiding in the city. No worries from them now, the enemies smirk. Crowds of pilgrims had swelled Jerusalem to the bursting point over the Passover weekend that had gone home now, back to their villages, bearing a disquieting story of how the Galilean healer had been killed. We are still angry, of course, but the danger of riot over the Nazarene's trial and execution is past. But that's how things stood just before dawn. Sad, tragic. So much hope, so much promise, but now it has come to nothing. A movement so full of exuberance had been crushed its famous leader cut down, its lieutenants hiding, its followers scattered. But after the storm, as always, life must go on. And now we meet Mary Magdalene. She has been one of the Nazarene's most devoted followers. She, with some of the women, have risen very early to honor the teacher's body and are headed for the garden tomb just outside the city walls. Within the sepulchre, he lies cold and lifeless on a rock slab. Mary Magdalene had been there Friday night. Her own hands had helped wash and prepare the body. The woman in turn were ready to witness and to help in whatever way they could that morning. They turned into the cemetery garden, walking numbly, one foot in front of the other. Mary looks up and shouts, the stone has been moved. She's excited. She runs into the garden, past the remnants of the smoky fire, the soldier's equipment in disarray and abandoned in haste. She sprints to the now open tomb. The ribbon and Roman seal 
that had gar guaranteed its safety hung limply in the morning air. Where is she? The other woman say, where is she running to? When she runs up to the tomb and shrieks as she steps inside. The darkness of the tomb and the concrete-like odor of fresh cut limestone at the back of her mouth overwhelm her for a moment. As her eyes adjust, they're on a shelf chisel from, on the, from the wall of the cave she can make out clothing, neatly fo folded. Where is Jesus? She looks around grave robbers. Runs out in a flash. She begins to go into the city. I will tell Peter and John. She calls as she speeds on. In a few moments, the disciple women will see an angel who tells them, he has risen, but by now Mary is back in Jerusalem. She pauses for a moment at the head of the street where the disciples are staying. Hands on her head, she's heaving, trying to catch her breath. Now she pounds on the door. Peter, Peter, she calls out. After a long pause, the disciple who, until recently, everyone acknowledged as the leader, opens the door crack, looks up and down the street. Finally, he motions Mary inside and quickly shuts the door. Somebody has taken the body out of the tomb, she says. We can't find him. Now Peter and John are in panic mode. They pull on their tunics and their sandals and they dash toward the cemetery. Mary following close behind. Slowly now, head down, she walks and she weeps. By the time she arrives back at the tomb, Peter and John have come and gone. The women are nowhere to be seen. She's alone. She pauses by the door for a long moment, weeping uncontrollably. Then she gathers herself and steps into the cold chamber. The sun is rising now, casting long shadows across the garden, but this time the tomb seems lit. Strange. Two men in bright white dressed in long robes that extend down to their feet rise as she enters. Why are you crying? She sobs out her story. They have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. She dissolves into tears. When she looks up, the men are gone. She turns, the stuns, silhouetting yet another man in the doorway. The gardener, she suppose, perhaps he'll know. Why are you crying, he says. What are you looking for? She begins her sad tale for the third time of the grave robbers who have desecrated the tomb and of the teacher who had healed her and restored her very life to wholeness. If you have taken him, she pleads, tell me where his body is and I'll see that it's retrieved. There'll be no trouble. Mary, the voice is so familiar. She looks up again in sudden recognition. Rabbi, she cries and falls to her feet. It is Jesus. He's not dead. He has risen from the grave. He is alive. He is resurrected, as he said. The storm has passed, and the sun has broken through the sky. It is a new day. What does it mean? What did it mean to Mary? First, her discredited Lord no longer lays in shame. He has been authenticated by God himself who raised him from the dead. With his lifeless body in the tomb, confusing doubt had come, but now everything he did and everything he taught 
had new meaning. It was all true. Jesus stayed with them on and off for more than a month. Then one day he ascended into heaven, but the spirit lingered and spread. Over the next few years, Mary watched the Christian movement grow in spurts from 100 to 3,000 in a single day, then to 5,000 men, more than a fifth of Jerusalem's entire population. Persecution came, but instead of snuffing out the story, the resurrection of the Son of God, persecution caused it to spread all the more. The movement raced like a wildfire to the furthest reaches of the world. Jesus was alive. Untold millions called him Lord and followed his teachings. Now old, facing her own impending death, Mary realizes one more thing that the resurrection means to her. The day in the garden, as she knelt before him, she had touched his pierced feet. No longer cold in her hands, as they had been that terrible Friday night when she had washed them. Now they were warm, alive. Yes, death will come soon to Mary, but she no longer fears it, for she has touched the one who has conquered death. And in her final moment, she smiles and says, just loud enough for those close by to hear, death, where is your terror? He has risen from the dead. Her eyes close for the last time and the sun is shining brightly indeed. And so on this Easter Sunday, it is important to remember that hope and love came back to us from death. Nothing could hold back this love. Happy Easter. And may all your days ahead be sunny. God bless.